Good afternoon. I'm going to take sort of a different perspective uh, from most of the other presentations as I know nothing about tra passenger transportation. My focus is, is freight transportation involved in the supply chain area. And just to give it a, a sort of a, a perspective on it, roughly half the uh, fuel that we use around the world, half of it goes for passengers, half of it goes for freight. So it's a huge chunk of, of the fuel that most of us take for granted because we can walk into stores and buy pretty much what we want. It's always there. And we don't know how it got there. We don't know what the cost of the processes were, but we know it's there, so we just don't worry about it. Uh, there's been a, a, a book uh, wrote, la written last year called Door to Door, and I think it puts some of the perspective on that, and it gives a number of examples in terms of what it takes to get freight to your house. So your morning cup of coffee that you pick up from Starbucks or around here from Bigby's, uh, it's got 100,000 miles on it. 100,000 miles that stuff is moved from some Amazon forest and put all the pieces together to deliver it to you. Your Apple iPhone has about a million miles on it as it's moved around the world a number of times across multiple oceans as the pieces come together to make your phone. And again, we take it for granted that that happens. That's the freight system that we support that's sort of in the background, and, but it's very much relevant for the transportation discussion. So I um, dug in my information about different types of uh, autonomous transportation, and we mentioned this today in terms of, of what it is from a freight point of view, um, in terms of the level of automation. Where are we at in, in the truck fleet? Well, we certainly have some examples of automation in heavy duty trucks. The trucks move the majority of the freight uh, uh, for us around the country. Uh, the uh, railroads move a lot of the um, dense and, and bulk product. Uh, airplanes move the very expensive product, but the bulk, the, the majority of the product, the, the biggest cost of it, and the biggest uh, usage of labor is, is via the truck fleet. Uh, this was an example of the Daimler Autonomous Truck, which I think was in, uh, what, 2015, 2016 time frame. There are a number of them being tested on the road, uh, either not, not much in the public domain, but certainly in the, uh, uh, the testing, testing environment. Um, so this was uh, uh, the, the autonomous truck, June 2015. It reduces uh, human error and reduces driver distraction. To put this in per another point of perspective is that truck drivers um, is not a really good life. Uh, we have about uh, we're about 35,000 short per year, and that prediction is expected to continue for the next 10 years. So 350,000 truck drivers. I doubt that any of you really you know volunteer to want to be a truck driver. It doesn't pay bad, but it's a miserable job uh, because you're gone for one to two weeks at a time. So the idea of an autonomous vehicle is really exciting for the fleets in, in terms of the possibility, something that doesn't require a person to do it. And we're using more and more trucks to, to, to move uh, product. Um, so that gives you an example of what the potential benefits could be. Well, there's a number of applications for autonomous vehicles in the supply chain. And this, as I dug through this, was, was sort of interesting because there's a lot of places we could use it short of the open road. I mean, we could certainly use it on the open road, but there's a lot of other places we could use it as well. Uh, internal use of facilities for materials flow and, and, and logistics. Movement within plants and warehouses. I've been in many plants and warehouses uh, over my years in, in supply chain and there's not a lot of autonomous vehicles. Most of them still today are run using electronics in the floor where it follows a guide path, path of some sort. Some of them are just starting to rec use uh, vision to recognize movements in that. The, the problem with the, um, the guide path method is it's very inflexible and warehouses and plants today are designing to be flexible where they can change stuff around. They want to adapt real quickly to changes in the environment, and that's not there. The second one is containers uh, transport and storage. When the containers come into ports, uh, they have to be offloaded from a ship, 
Basically, ships today have uh, about 20,000 containers. The newest ships have about 20,000 containers. Uh, that's about 100 trains, not 100 rail cars, but 100 trains moving out of there quick. And um, so it's got to pull the container off, move it to a rail car, or move it to a truck, and then have the truck take it to a rail car. It's not a very exciting process, but it is a expensive and slow process. So if you have a, a 20,000 um, container ship, you don't want it sitting in the port very long. And it takes a long time to unload that many containers. So the, the idea of container transport and storage either within a, a port facility or in a plant facility, uh, the objective is they want to shorten the trips, uh, they want to reduce empty trips and enhance resource utilization. Uh, one of the characteristics of that is that's done by the longshoremen. Uh, the longshoremen is a really interesting union. They're the ones guys that unload and guys and gals that unload and load containers. Uh, they're probably the best paid union labor you've ever seen. And they're very inflexible in terms of how they do it. So again, there's, there's an opportunity there. Uh, <clears throat> There's another question in terms of application, whether you're dealing with over-the-road trucks or the long-haul trucks, the people that drive stuff from here to California or from California to New York. Uh, those are the four or five day trips, the ones that uh, amount to, uh, when you're out there, it's two to uh, one to two weeks on the road away from your family. So it's not a desirable situation. And usually it, it fluctuates if the, uh, if the construction industry is good, people will do construction rather than drive trucks. If the construction industry is bad, then they'll drive trucks to, to make up. So that's sort of the, the trade-off you're, you're getting there. And as I said, right now with the industry doing fairly well, uh, there's a, a big shortage of truck drivers. I've worked with the state MEDC. One of the big shortages we have in the state of Michigan is truck drivers. Um, and then you have dangerous and undesirable assignments, hauling um, fuel, hauling gasoline, uh, hauling radioactive material, all that kind of stuff that nobody wants to get anywhere near of, somebody has to drive it. And so there's a lot of opportunities for people um, to, do, to do that. Another example, most of, of you uh, wouldn't relate to, but the new Meyer facility out on the west side of town. The ice cream that you have is in a uh, is stored in a part of the warehouse that's 35 degrees below zero, and people have to work in there. Uh, there is no jacket that keeps you comfortable at 35 degrees below zero. It's just painfully cold. Could you do that with automation? Absolutely, but again, you have to have the equipment that does that. Use cases for autonom autonomous freight transportation. Uh, interstate pilot, or interstate driver, uh, and, and free navigation to deal with congestion and overcome driving restrictions. A number of years ago, um, the uh, transportation industry had put in some hours of service restrictions, changing the amount of time drivers can spend on the road and how many breaks they have to have. This would be a way to get uh, to be able to change those. The results of the the, from the old uh, hours of service rules to the new ones was a 9% uh, increase in freight costs. And the way we see that is higher priced products. So there's that, that trade off we have to look at. Uh, vehicle on demand without a driver and free navigation such as to replace over the road drivers. The idea of platooning which is used in Europe I'm not aware that it's used here where we have a truck driver who's in a lead vehicle and the other ones behind them that are entirely automated. And so they, the lead vehicle is in a sense connected to a number of, ones, a number of vehicles, five or six vehicles behind them. Very plausible way to do it, very plausible way to, do, to reduce the requirement of uh, truck drivers. Uh, and uh, we require some technology to do that. And potentially dedicated lanes, but obviously that's a fairly expensive solution to the problem. Um, the full automation using driver for extended availability, the idea that the driver can pursue other value-added activities during the drive. So again, we're dealing with long-term, long-haul long truck drivers. They could do other activities in terms of the process and only be called to the, to the, uh, the cab, if you will, uh, when it's required. 
Uh, other examples would be valet parking. Uh, if we look at the uh, logistics of road operations, and you know, we spend a lot of time talking about this part, which is the fleet part. There's a lot of it back here in the plant in terms of moving products around that right now require talent to do it. And this is not a, a cheap part of the, the, the movement either because hiring, hiring drivers is difficult, hiring warehouse operations personnel is, not, is difficult as well. And that's primarily because <coughs> of uh, restrictions and drug laws. And it's difficult to get people who haven't had the, uh, uh, um, have, don't use drugs to, to put in this kind of job. So there's this part of it in terms of the warehouse operations. One of the ones that Amazon has done is use automation in their Kiva system, which is one of the unique things they have. But the other part that most of us take for granted is this part, which is the last, last mile delivery. Um, our whole mode of buying stuff is changing. You know, we used to go to the store and buy stuff. When I talk to my graduate students and I say, how many Amazon orders do you make per day? My wife, I thought my wife was bad. Don't tell her this, Anne Marie. How many Amazon orders do you make today? Two or three. They get two or three shipments per day from Amazon. What does that do for local delivery? Uh, and that's exactly where we're at. We all want the stuff delivered to our home in a very timely manner. Another way to use uh, line haul transportation, and this is the one I, I mentioned earlier, where you have the, uh, the platooning of trucks, or potentially the, the full automation of trucks. This is the, the application for long haul. That's where you would help with the drivers, uh, and uh, it would help continue using the vehicles, because instead of having the vehicle sit there for uh, uh, eight hours a day, or um, which is because you can drive for, for 11, so you have to have the vehicle sit or have an alternative driver to get the rest of the day used. You could use the vehicle pretty much continuously, which make it much more productive. And then internal within a warehouse, uh, again, a lot of potential for automation there. And again, a lot of this is done today but uh, this is, illustrates the Amazon and Kiva system. A lot of that's done today, but most of it is run by wire, wire in, in floor, uh, so that's not very flexible. Moving it to an automated system, which this, the, the Amazon and Kiva system where the little guy uh, moves the whole pallet of goods around, uh, is, is how they deal with so much of their stuff so, uh, so effectively. Uh, the, the critical difference, though, in terms of the level of automation in the warehouse, it doesn't handle economy of scale very well. And since a lot of our supply chain builds on economy of scale, you've got all big amounts to make it cheap enough, that's part of the challenge. So what are the benefits? Uh, first, uh, the obvious one is it helps overcome a driver shortage problem, which will continue to be a problem. It will continue to be worse and uh, the result is we're going to see our cost of goods increase uh, and uh, the, uh, the availability of drivers go down. It reduces the impact of driving restrictions, such as time, uh, as we use hazard uh, hours of service to limit the time people can drive. Legitimate issue in terms of safety, but uh, is there a way we can overcome it? And certainly autonomous vehicles would help with that. Uh, reduce accidents. Most fleet accidents are, are due to driver error. Um, so that would certainly be a positive thing. Reduce driver monotony, uh, particularly if you're on the road for four or 500 miles a day, it would get real monotonous. Uh, increase efficiency resulting in lower environmental impact. Um, Trucks spend about an hour a day sitting uh, you know, in some type of traffic jam and waiting there to, uh, uh, it consumes obviously the driver's times and it consumes fuel. Better planning, more 24 hour operations can get you by some of that and reduce congestion. Because congestion is a huge issue, particularly at critical um, sites in the supply chain, such as major cities or major ports. What are the challenges? Um, the Vienna UN Convention, the systems must 
they'll autonomously steer a car if permissible if they can be stopped by the driver at any time. This was just uh, renewed in Vienna two years ago. And that's the 70 countries sort of support that system. Concerns from the automotive driver sharing the road. How are automotive drivers, we talked about automotive drivers, how are they gonna like seeing a truck with no driver? It's bad enough when they have a driver and they're going with three trailers down the, the, the turnpike. How will it be when they, they don't have a driver? How are the uh, Teamsters gonna react to this? Teamsters are the, one of the major remaining unions and they're the ones that control uh, the truck in industry and they're very active as are the, uh, the team, uh, the uh, longshoremen. Um, carriers may not like it either because it's gonna make them uh, reduce differentiation of what they offer, the service levels that they offer. They, they can differentiate by what, what their, um, what their employees, the types of solutions, the things that their employees provide. This will be pretty much standardized, that kind of service. Uneven development of transportation regulation at the state level. Uh, I think somebody suggested earlier the Sunbelt Coalition with Michigan, Ohio, and Pennsylvania to test this, but the regulations, what regulations are there gonna be for, uh, well, injury, property damage, and customs and compliance? And we were changing the whole regulation structures to who's responsible for it. So the potential is, is, is good, the benefits are significant. Um, it's a lot of changes in an environment that uh, is, I mean, the individuals certainly, the individual driving units are certainly a major opportunity as well. This one requires a lot more people to work together. Thank you.